My name is Laura Shen. Good afternoon, everyone. I am a first year full time student at um, UCLA Anderson. I'm uh, delighted to be the panel director and be introducing our first panel this afternoon focused on innovation. Um, and it's titled A Two Way Interchange Between the United States and China. So nowadays, uh, innovators around the world are no longer content with doing business in one market, one country, or even in just one continent. Innovation and technology provided new ventures with the potential of capturing values globally much faster than traditional industries. Uh, success, now we see successful business models are being transplanted cross-border. Ventures in the US and China are forming alliances and companies are globalizing faster than ever. And we also see increasing foreign capital financing projects. Um, so in short, um, these days, greater opportunities exist for the globalization of Chinese companies. Our distinguished panelists will share their experiences driving innovations through new strategies, technologies, and products, as well as their successes and lessons learned from engaging in cross-border collaborations. The panelists on this panel are Shen Li, General Manager of Suning.com, USA, Sorry, that's, um, that's Susan, actually. <laughs> the lady who just stood up was Susan Yao. Um, she's the regional manager of Broad, Broad USA. Um, so also Dr. Shan Li. Uh, he's the general manager of Suning.com USA. If you can just wave. Uh, we also have Stella Lee. She's the senior vice president of BYD and president of BYD Motors, Inc. And lastly, we have Sean Luo, President of China Mobile International USA. This panel will be moderated by Ira Kasov. Um, Dr. Kasov is a recognized expert on Asia, and he has also lived and worked extensively in, in the region, including 10 years in mainland China, eight in Hong Kong, and two in Taiwan. From 2010 to 2013, he was Senior Counselor at EPCO Worldwide, a global public affairs consultancy and currently serves on the EPCO International Advisory Council. Before joining EPCO, Dr. Kasov served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Asia, where he oversaw Asia trade policy for the department, engaged in trade negotiations with officials of key counterpart governments, including China, and served as the Senior Advisor on Asia to two Secretaries of Commerce. From 1985 to 2007, he was a diplomat and served seven assignments in Asia, including senior positions in the U.S. Consulates General in Shanghai and Hong Kong. Now, please join me and welcome our moderator and panelists for our first panel discussion. Great. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us for this important panel. I was going to begin with some comments about the importance of innovation, but I, I don't think I need to. I think everyone uh, knows the importance of innovation, and, and the uh, previous speakers kind of led into this very nicely. Um, so in the interest of time, what I'd like to do is um, introduce each panelist in a little more detail, ask them to um, give us a couple of minutes of opening remarks um, about themselves, their company, and, and their connection to innovation. Uh, then I'll ask some questions to kind of guide the conversation. Uh, and then hopefully leave some time for questions from the, um, from the audience. Uh, so with no further ado, let me introduce uh, uh, Shang Li. As you heard, he's the general manager of Suning.com USA. He's responsible for developing and managing U.S.-China cross-border retail business for Suning Commerce Group. Suning is China's largest non-governmental company. It started in 1990 as a wholesaler of air conditioners and has since transformed itself into a multinational conglomerate and a dominant player in China's retail market and commercial real estate. Shang was trained as an engineer and has a PhD in mechanical engineering from UCLA. He has specialized in global business operations, program management, large and large systems integration. He's lived and worked in the US, Japan, Singapore, and Taiwan, and is known for his capabilities in building and managing multinational engineering and business teams. So uh, let me begin, Shang, by asking you to talk for a couple of minutes, if you would, about uh, yourself and your company and its connection to innovation. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm from the retail industry, so I would like to make a few quick comments about this interesting topic. Uh, Cross-border is not 
something new. I mean, I talked to our moderator before. He said he worked between uh, China and uh, U.S. since 1979, right? So Longer why are we? than many of the people in the audience. I know, lived, I, I know. So <laughs> why, why are we here, right? Marco Polo has done it for many, many years, <laughs> right? Many of you here doing import export. So uh, what's the innovation that is so important for us today from the retail industry, I would like to point out something that actually is the holy grail. It's the cross-border online retail. Imagine that when I'm speaking to you right now, somebody on my platform is ordering baby formulas, and she probably is riding a subway in Shanghai, right? So many, many American companies that in the past knows that China is a very big company, uh, country. And there are many, many big companies that you can work with. And there are billions of people that actually you can sell product to. But in the past, none of that has been so accessible to us. These days, if you work properly and build out the right infrastructure and facility, you actually sell, cutting through all these Marco Polos <laughs> directly <laughs> to the Chinese consumers. Uh, that, that's something that hasn't been done before, and we are probably at the calendar year zero for cross-border online retail. Great, thank you. Um, so let me turn now to uh, Stella Lee. Uh, she is the uh, Senior Vice President of BYD Company Limited, and also serves as the President of BYD Motors Inc., which is a Southern California-based company that imports renewable power products, green energy products, and zero emission vehicles from China. She receives her bachelor's degree in statistics from Fudan University in Shanghai in 1992. Uh, in 1996, she joined BYD as marketing manager for global exports. 1997, she opened BYD's first overseas office in Hong Kong, then founded the first European office in Rotterdam in 1999. In 2011, she set up BYD's North America headquarters here in LA. Uh, in 2010, she was assigned to be president of BYD Motors, Inc. and started promoting the BYD auto business into the North and South America markets. Stella. So actually, BYD grew up with innovation. The company started in 1995 with only 350,000 US dollar investment, mm. with only 20 people. So then by today, we have 150,000 people. And then by the 10%, 15,000 are R&D engineer. So then BYD was the first company to invent the uh, manual process to produce a very high quality lithium ion battery that we've been successfully been qualified by Motorola and bring BYD to the international company. So that's the way BYD grew up by, from innovation. And the, even for today, everybody talking about the future and talking about the green car. If maybe not many people know the first plug-in HEV was invented by BYD. So that's the, mm. just our name is Build Your Dreams. Everybody here have your dreams. So when you have a dream, you, you will have a lot of innovation. <laughs> yes. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, our next uh, uh, panelist is uh, Susan Yao. She is a uh, regional manager of uh, Broad USA. Since 2002, she has been working in Broad Group's various offices, including Tianjin, Beijing, and, and here in California. Her rich experience and professional background has led her to build cooperation with global companies and well-known clients, including Qualcomm, Princeton University, City of Hope, and UCSD. She and her highly trained team have been recognized three times as the sales champion team. Broad Group is an organization based on the vision of unique technologies and the tenet of preserving life. All of the company's products and services are essentially optimizing human life and the environment. Broad supplies non-electrical central air conditioning that is powered by natural gas and waste heat together with a packaged water distribution system, which is twice as energy efficient as traditional central air conditioning. Broad Air Quality Company Limited supplies heat recovery fresh air machines that can filter 99% of PM2.5 mobile air quality monitors. Broad Sustainable Building Company Limited provides factory-made sustainable buildings featuring 90% prefabrication that are five times more energy proficient 99% PM 2.5 filtration and can withstand a nine uh, magnitude earthquake. Wow, very impressive, <laughs> <laughs> especially for LA. Thank you, Ira, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, I'm Susan from Broader. 
so today I I'm not going to talk about how good we are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I just want to share some broader culture and small stories regarding innovation. So actually, innovation is broader life. Um, I want to share two stories. For me, I joined abroad in 2002. So in 2004, Broad made a big decision to send me to Airbus headquarters to learn something from first class manufacturer for three months. You know, you can't imagine. I'm new, you know, I'm new, I'm fresh guy in there at that time. <laughs> I'm very base position just for sales. It's, you know, a lot of cost. A lot, you know, they pay a lot of attention on schedule this event. So at that time, actually, I was touched and uh, I learned a lot from Airbus during that time. So you can imagine how work hard I working for Broad for the long time, you know? <laughs> yes, Broad offer a great opportunity for training the employees. So another story I want to share with you guys. One day, our chairman, uh, Mr. Zhang Yue, met a painter, you know, the lowest position of our manufacturer during the lunch time. So it looked like the, the painter, you know, was unhappy, expressed. So our chairman asked him, what's wrong with you? Don't you like the food? So he said, no, just because I have two sons. Both of them need to go to university this year. It's hard for me to pay, you know, the tuition fee. So how much you need? Our chairman asked him. 16,000 RMB, almost $10,000. So our chairman said, okay. So soon, the painter got a call from our financial department and got a money he needed. Yes, this very, you know, very small stories. But, uh, broad, you know, broad culture is all the employees are broad greatest richness. So why, you know, we are develop, develop the international marketing in 1996. The first target is U.S. market. So even U.S. market, you know, is the most difficult and uh, most demanding. We have too got a lot of license, a lot of uh, certifications, but we decided to do, to do that. So we got our first project, Princeton University. And we also got the second project, Qualcomm in San Diego, you know, high technology company. So then many, many products came to broad. So many people ask our chairman, you know, yes, uh, you know, stop here. I, I want to ask you a question. Before I'm here, have you heard broad? Before I told you, how many? Please let me know how many know broad. Oh, <laughs> I'm disappointed. <laughs> uh, do you know why? Because we only focus on commercial chillers. This is the first reason. The second reason, our chillers powered by all the waste heat, not electricity, you know. So all the chiller you heard, all the compressor you heard, is powered by electricity. So our central air conditioning powered by all the waste heat. The waste heat from like solar turbine, the generators, you know, like Hubston, like GE, they, have a huge, they build huge generators. We got all the waste heat from them. So we also can, our children can also eat, you know, solar. So we can take solar, got hot water to provide free cooling. So that's a big difference. That's, you know, a lot of unique, unique technologies in our children. So I think 
Yes, that's right. all. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And I want to thank you for your contribution to Princeton. Princeton is where I went to graduate school. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and, and where my daughter goes to school now. So, oh, uh, so I thank you very much. Uh, so our fourth speech, uh, speaker is Sean Law. Sean and I actually were on a panel together in uh, Long Beach uh, last, uh, last month. Um, Sean has been working in the telecommunications industry for more than 20 years since he graduated with his MS degree uh, from South China University of Technology. Before, becoming to, uh, before coming to the US in 2000, Sean had become one of the youngest directors during his 10-year service for China Telecom. After earning his MS in management and policy from State University of New York at Stony Brook, he joined CM Tel USA as general manager and made the subsidiary of China uh, Motion Telecom, a listed company in Hong Kong, become one of the key players in the US telecom market. Later, he was promoted to EVP to supervise all operations in both North America and Europe on behalf of China Motion Telecom. He started up his own telecommunications company, Megatel, in 2009 and led his team to reach nearly $20 million in revenue in 2013. Sean. Yeah. Uh, it's my great pleasure to come here again. You know, last year so I came to this panel, uh, the similar panel uh, last year. But, um, so um, we're glad to be here again. Uh, so uh, I have to tell you something about the, um, my experience in telecommunication industry. Because as all you know, so after graduation, I have been always working in this industry. I can see the innovation, especially in technology, innovation made this industry totally different. As a company itself, you can see the innovation on technology made them progress at the same time and made them fail. You can see, you have around like Nokia. Everybody have a Nokia before, you know. Right now, everybody have an app, Apple, iPhone. So that means that innovation is very important for the company, not just for their success, also for their survival, you know. So when I first joined the, our company, um, I think in, in 1990s, at that time that uh, we talked about the switch. I probably someone uh, the switch. The what's the function for a switch? The switch is used to run the call to the right destination according to the number you input. For example, A6 is a country code in China, right? So you put A6, they will run the right destination, right routes to there. Okay. At the beginning, long long time ago, they used uh, manually switching. They used people to switch that call to an, another, another line. And then they have a mechanical switch. And later, the digital switch. At that time, they use hardware. So right now, actually, they use soft switch. So what, but, but for, for the people who use a telephone, maybe they don't feel so much difference. But for a company, it's a total difference. As I just mentioned, I used to have a setup company called Megatel. I use a soft switch technology, it saved a lot of money for me. The, the same switch, the hardware switch, I have to purchase in 2000 for another company called CMTEL. At that time, cost about like 200,000 US dollars to buy that one switch, including software. But when I started my company in 2008, I bought a soft switch. It cost me a couple thousand dollars for the hardware, just normal, that's Dell servers, just normal servers, and a little bit money for the software. So just then 10,000 US dollars. I can start up my own company with the same volume, maybe better performance. That's the technology made us totally different for the company. If you don't follow the, follow the trend, you don't have an innovation, your company cannot be successful. Maybe you will be, you will be forgot, forget quite soon on the market. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So. Um, let me shift the focus a little bit and um, try to uh, zero in a little bit on, on China and US-China. Um, China actually has been trying for a long time, for over 100 years actually, to foster the development of science and technology and become more innovative. My degree is in Chinese history, so I always take a long-term historical point of view. Um, but uh, to bring it back to the present, one of the central themes of the NPC meetings, the National People's Congress meetings that were just concluded a couple of weeks ago, was the encouragement of innovation and entrepreneurship. Actually, Alan referred to this uh, just a few minutes ago. As he said, the government unveiled its Made in China 2025 strategy that seeks to transform China into a leading global technology producer within 10 years. They also introduced something called Internet, their Internet Plus Action Plan, another high-tech program that seeks to integrate big data and cloud computing with modern manufacturing. 
And as part of this strategy, the government will guide investment into prioritized industries using policy incentives such as tax uh, deductions for R&D uh, investment and so forth. So in a way, looking at this, uh, uh, stepping back a little bit, this is kind of a continuation of what China has been trying to do for a long time, a sort of a top-down attempt to foster innovation through, through government policy. Uh, and whether they're more successful this time or not uh, remains to be seen. But at the same time, there are also private efforts going on that are more bottom-up and more similar to, uh, to what happens in this country. There was recently a, an interesting article in the New York Times, I'm not sure if any of you saw it, about a billionaire Chinese investor named Zhang Lei who heads a private equity fund called Hill House Capital Group. They've been very successful investing in high-tech startups, uh, and they now have a war chest that's estimated at $18 billion. They were an early investor, for example, in Tencent uh, and made a, a ton of money on that. Uh, Tencent now is worth $180 billion. And in the New York Times article, Zhang was quoted as saying, China can be one of the engines of this whole global innovation revolution. So, so with that by way of introduction, um, I'd be interested to ask the panelists their thoughts about innovation in China, um, how they see the prospects for success of both this kind of top-down government policy approach, the bottom-up uh, approach, and to share their um, observations on the different approaches to innovation in China versus in the U.S. So maybe we can go down the uh, yeah. go down the road. Uh, I think I would like to answer this question uh, with a comment on the previous talk. The previous mm. talk talked about America being a consumer-driven economy for many, many, many years, and and talk about how China is becoming one of this kind of economy. And from my point of view, again, I'm from retail industry, China is a consumer-driven industry already. Mm -hmm. And that can be proved by the picture that uh, the previous talker uh, put it on, and two shopping bags with national flags. Because <laughs> these two countries are the only two countries I know have national shopping holidays. <laughs> right. Thanksgiving is just warming up for Black Friday, <laughs> according to my wife, of course. <laughs> right. And from China, we have single state, right? Uh, November 11th. <laughs> so many, many retail uh, companies have uh, their top research labs in Silicon Valley. I'm from um, Silicon Valley. So, you know, Amazon has A9, uh, Walmart has uh, Walmart Labs. Why? It echoes um, what Era just said, that innovation you know, in a new environment, in a new era, that actually is where you can find new value, where you create values for your company. And again, cross-border online retail is where people start to realize there are so many new things that you can do. Right? Using internet is not a tool anymore. It's not a tool you um, uh, send emails. It's not a tool you interact with other people. It's a tool. It's actually an environment where people do business. And it was a virtual world, but now it becomes the real. The, the virtual and the physical store actually are the same. People talk about O2O, online to offline, offline to online. Mm. Right? You, you shop wherever you go with a smartphone. You, you have the real world and the virtual world mixed together. It's not that clear cut anymore. And because it's a new world, so no matter what you do, it's kind of innovation, right? It's very easy to innovate and it's necessary to innovate. And there are many, many companies that you haven't heard of right now in Silicon Valley and wish.com, I don't know whether you heard of $300 million uh, venture capital invested already. And I talked to another company, box.com, another 30 million. And these are new company only 20 people. They want to be the next uh, Costco. They want to be the next Amazon, right? Amazon is facing the same challenge now. Amazon is opening up uh, stores in China. They want to do exactly what I said. They want to sell baby formula to that particular mother riding subway in Shanghai. They mm -hmm. want to cut through all these people, mm -hmm. also through all these middlemen. And in the past, it's impossible. Now, today, it's real, and it's happening every day, and there are so many different companies, they believe they have the winning formula and they are implementing it. And we are going to see those companies in the coming years, in the new era. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Thank you. Still? Yeah. yeah. I think it, this is the best time really talking about the innovation. Even for China from government, you will see the top leader now start talking about the China dream. It's no longer made in China. The, in the past 30 years, everything is made in China. Use resource to get the, the first maybe foundation wealth. But now everybody, like, even from the top, talking about like innovation, creative, and uh, technology. So this is uh, on the top level for that. But for the whole industry, a lot of the internet company success actually opened the eyes for a lot of young people. If you have good idea, then it don't need a big investment uh, like before. Then you have an idea, you want a small office with a computer, you can create your company, you can start your own company. So this makes innovation much easier. And uh, plus, we're talking about a lot of funding, a lot of virtual fund, and a lot of invest capital fund is ready because they got to enjoy the big success in the past 10 years. So they are ready to invest. But then, from another world, we are talking about the opportunity. Because everybody is talking about the, today is now we are in the fourth industry, maybe revolution, and it's Gen 4. And then future will be more automation. Even when in the auto industry, it's a very conservative industry. But looking for future, 10 years, if any auto company, they, they introduce a new car, it's not a hybrid car, without a, maybe 50% like intelligent work, then nobody will call that as a car. Maybe it's called as an old machine. There they, they was no market for that. And then second is uh, talking about the climate change. Then like uh, all the people recognized uh, uh, like importance to reduce dependence on the fossil fuel. So just like they were pushed more to, um, to the solar, to the, to the wind farm, and uh, with battery storage. And then this, this kind of like environment is push the whole industry actually to, for the future generation. The, it's really what changing uh, the whole change for the whole industry, including the car, including the, our energy. This is the most competitive, uh, like a traditional, 100 years, no change. Then to, in next maybe 20 years, what big change. But then it's a build a bridge between internet and uh, also the cloud with, together with auto. So that's the reason you hear a lot of, like uh, Google, the auto company, they were the company in, uh, like uh, first announced they would do the auto driving. And uh, recently, a lot of uh, hot topics, Apple started to maybe announce they were going to make an Apple car. Mm -hmm. And the Tesla car, <laughs> you, enjoy to, you enjoy the car, it's, uh, because uh, you see the, uh, the car is more like a computer. Then for BYD, our philosophy, the car in the future is more like an ele electric uh, car. Is you change from the mechanical control, which response time is around the 300 milliseconds. But now future is electric control. Response time is like 20 milliseconds. So this, what does this mean? This means the whole safety of the car, 80% of the car accident going to be avoided with a future electric vehicle. So this is fundamentally mm. innovation mm. for the whole industry. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, Susan? Yes. Uh, I think in the past uh, 150 years, innovation in China was interrupted by wars and uh, all kinds of revolutions. Mm. Uh, but if, so at that time, I think innovation, the only goal for innovation just uh, for survive. Uh, even so, I think we still had a lot of scientists who in, in innovate a lot. So that's why today I think uh, all of us are here. Mm. So I also think you know, uh, we are behind of our education systems. It also means we have a lot of space to create. So yeah, that's all. Okay. Uh, according to my observation, uh, the innovation means different uh, in China and USA, mm -hmm. even though they are innovation. Uh, that's because I think about the regulation is different, the culture difference, and maybe that um, uh, uh, business environment is different. Uh, uh, we talk about the internet, especially like mobile internet, because uh, most of innovation on internet business in China right now 
is not from zero to one. It's from one to n. <laughs> why, why have that happened, right? Uh, one of the things uh, is a uh, intellectual uh, property protection one is not so good in China. Right now, it's still, they are improving, but not so good in China. Uh, another thing is the property education system. They, they, they cannot encourage people to have innovation ideas. And the third thing is that it's not just the, the whole environment. But within the organization, within the company, inside, they don't have uh, this kind of environment. Okay, that's the small side. But, but the bigger side is the society, the whole society. They don't have an environment to give you innovation to survive. But at, th at this moment, I think copy and modification, we call this business model in the internet business in China. When you name a, a, a popular uh, companies like Baidu, in, China, in, in USA they have Google, right? Yeah. You talk about the way, so you know anything, like Tencent, WeChat, they have a, like ICQ before, right? Right now, hey, watch, watch app. So they have, a, like Uber, they have a Didi uh, Da and <laughs> Airbnb, they have a, what, they have a Xiao Zhu Kuai, Xiao, Xiao Zhu, Duan Zhu, something like this. Or, or yeah, they, they just copy a modification, and then they succeed because of the large population, because of the undeveloped infrastructure or service sectors in China. So in this case, I, um, I can give you an example about the mobile internet. Mobile internet, so right now, I tell you, in China, it's more popular. I have a figure here. I think you, I think Sean just mentioned about that, the, 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 the national shopping holiday, right? <laughs> I think in China, they have one. I think it's, a, it's a November 11, I remember, right? Alibaba have a record. And, but according to the statistic, for that day, 42.6% uh, of the shopping is goes through the mobile phone, smartphone. But in the meantime, so in USA, only 24.2% uh, go through the smartphone. Another thing is the smartphone uh, penetration rate. 66% in, in China and 53% in USA. So what's the reason for that? That's a different. If you are a business owner, if you run, want to run a retail business or e-commerce you know, on the website, you will think, like, what's the difference for that? How we can approach that? That's innovation. That's just something like a, okay, it's marketing innovation, right? Not just technology. Uh, we can see one of the things is a smartphone is very cheap. Talk about Xiaomi. 100 US dollar can buy a smartphone. We cannot buy it here, right? But I know Xiaomi has a, has a, has a plan to, to enter this market, right? <laughs> So another issue is, uh, I think the Chinese people, um, they have something, they have something, um, they follow the public. Because uh, you have a smartphone, I have, to have one. So everybody got a smartphone. They don't know what the real smartphone really, you know, give them what. So, and, and the third thing I'm saying is, uh, because of the credit card, uh, credit system. In China, they don't have a mature credit monitoring system. That's why they use, uh, I think the e-commerce e retailer, they try to use mobile phone to, to prevent the fraud transaction. Because a cell phone, when you get a cell phone, you need ID. That means that you're a real person. If you're a PC, you can go to a, you know, the, like a, like a, uh, any, any PC to, to make a transaction, right? But for the phone, for the smartphone, you just like ID. That means that you are the you. And then I can catch you if you do something wrong. That's why the Alibaba try to encourage people use smartphone to do shopping on their website. So I think um, there's so many different things, uh, different innovation, different things in China and USA. But innovation is a big concept for all the companies in both countries to survive, to succeed. That's my, Thank my, you. my thought. Thank you. I, I want to actually follow up on one of the things you said mm -hmm. and maybe ask the other panelists if they have any thoughts mm -hmm. on the, um, mm -hmm. your comment about education. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a, um, a pretty widely held perception that the Chinese education system, which depends on memorization and learning lots of facts, mm -hmm. doesn't uh, promote a, a innovation. It doesn't lead to independent thinking. Mm -hmm. 
which is maybe why so many Chinese students come here to UCLA to, uh, to study. Um, <laughs> it's, but, uh, the weather. it's the weather. <laughs> it's the weather. Well, they, <laughs> it's the weather. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious if any of the other panelists have any thoughts on whether they think that's true, uh, number one. And number two, if, if it is true, does it have a, uh, an effect on, uh, on the, the prospects for, uh, for innovation in China? I thought I saw you shaking your head before when he. Uh, oh, when he that's was why you yeah. have this question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, then I have to disagree. Right? <laughs> uh, I I grew up in Taiwan, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, and I came here 1988. And you know, I studied here, so uh, my my kids grew up here. So I don't think they are more innovative than me. <laughs> they better not be. <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think the education they have here is superior. Um, yes, it's different, and at this moment, mm -hmm. I believe uh, there's no advantage for education mm -hmm. in one particular country over the other, mm -hmm. and I really don't believe that we are so advanced in terms of creating new company, in terms of venture capital investment, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of internet, okay? So, uh, for example, uh, third-party payment, China is way advanced than us, right? Uh, we have Google Wallet before, now we have uh, Apple Pay, but nothing compared with WeChat's, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it in English now, Chang Hong Bao, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, Facebook is trying to come up with this third party uh, payment system because they see the success. Imagine how successful that third party payment system during the Chinese New Year. Billions of people participated and billions of money trans. Uh, transfer it uh, between hands, mm -hmm. and th that's the power of internet. You know, mm -hmm. there's no boundary. There's no uh, things that you are not supposed to do. There's no government regulations. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's some. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a topic today. But I'm I'm just saying that I've seen many many smart people mm -hmm. from China, smart young people dare to dream, dare to execute. So mm -hmm. there's no you know such a difference now. You know, no matter where you come from, it mm. really depends on whether you are there to dream and your education and your execution. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to comment on this? On the education? Uh, no? Um, okay, so, so um, I have lots of more questions, but what I'd like to do is maybe open it up to the audience. I'm sure there are a lot of questions out there as well. Uh, so I don't know if we, do we have microphones for people to, uh, to use? Uh, it turns out we do have a microphone, sir. Well prepared. Yeah. Saying they're recruiting during our uh, Vegas Saturday morning brunch, so they're actively trying to get talent uh, here in the United States in order to expand retail operations here in the U.S. And all of you are representing uh, all of you are representing uh, Chinese companies. They're also doing so. My question relates to how do you get over that initial hump that you are a Chinese company selling in a foreign territory that might not be very conducive to Chinese products. <laughs> Right? You have tons of issues that you have to deal with, from US labor issues to political perceptions of using a Chinese product, especially with a you know, large government contract and so forth. What are your strategies to convince the domestic market that your products are good and that there's nothing wrong with buying Chinese? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, yeah. Anyone want to volunteer or to like Well, yeah. he mentioned Alibaba, right? Okay. I'm from SUNY, so I okay. have to say something. Okay. Uh, Alibaba. <laughs> Otherwise, so I will get fired. Stir up a little rivalry. I brought my HR here <laughs> with me. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's challenging. And uh, I think that's why SUNY hired me, right? So, <laughs> uh, there, there are cultural differences. The, the product has different standards. You know, just like American product, when you go to China, now China has its own uh, FCC regulation, just like American. You know, uh, uh, power, you have the Chinese version of it. So, cross border these days, basically, you face the same. Uh, uh, problems. Like I said, I, I'm selling to China, right? I'm helping uh, many American companies selling directly to China. And my job in the second half of this year is selling to America. Just like what you mentioned Alibaba is trying to do. So basically we are competing uh, against uh, everybody and we are trying to achieve something I call it, I don't know whether people like it, it's global door to door. Basically at the end, it really doesn't matter where you are. You know, you can be traveling in Paris and remember, oh, 
next weekend when I go home, you know, I, I don't have the food for my kids. You, you bring out your smartphone, you start ordering. You, you can order from Amazon. Amazon is selling directly in China. You can order from me, right? So basically, there's no boundary and there's no uh, uh, particular corners of the world that you can stay and be profitable. Now, it's global. You have to compete at a global uh, uh, arena. So basically, what you mentioned uh, in terms of you know, uh, uh, perception, uh, even bias, you know, American product to China, you face the same thing. You go through the same barrier. You, you just need to go through this uh, thing, uh, uh, trying to cut all these middlemen, kill you know, uh, uh, Marco Polo in the process. And you, you, you just need to do that. That's, that's the challenge. There is no uh, easy way out. Anyone else have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I can say something, yeah. yeah. yeah because actually, uh, for the IT industry, I think if they come to US, they want to do similar success in China, will be a huge challenge. Because of the IP environment, protection is totally different. So, but uh, the same for them, they should bring the idea how they can successful in China to learn the culture, the, the legal system, the IP system here, to find some opportunities, then they can create some thing. Americanized, like a Chinese food came to US, became like, a, uh, like, a, like a, the American Chinese food. Yeah, this is very important for them. But then I like to take a chance also talking about the BYD story. So actually, BYD came to US. We came to US back to 2000. At that time, just myself came here, recruited some people, and uh, successfully introduced our products to Montola. Then we, we started uh, our jewelry here. But it's very different from 2011. When I came here, because I want to introduce BYD-made buses, BYD-made car here with BYD brand. So then, well, well, they immediately, like, our competition were labeled us, oh, Chinese company came to US, steal my technology, <laughs> steal my job. <laughs> yeah, because this is a very common perception for uh, most of politicians and also normal people here in US. So then BYD has to show them who is stealing whose technology. BYD have patent, 1,000 patents per year. In the battery, we have very strong technology. We are the biggest one in the world. Then BYD is bringing the technology to US, create a US job in reverse one. So we have to do a lot of PR, a lot of fighting. But again, it's, even I have a lot of international like a, uh, like a uh, experienced manager company, but still this, like a, this is a new challenge for me. I need to learn because of the way in China company doing is different. Most of Chinese company successfully, uh, Chinese company is focused on make a good products and a good business model. Then like a, all, the, all the investment, all the focus is on products, good service, competitive products, core technology. Then we never, we have very little money for the PR, very little money for legal mm. lawyer. <laughs> so, but here is totally different. <laughs> so everybody, you should have budget for that. Then to help you protect, to build the protection of war, and then you need to have the right PR company to tell the right story. But the one important thing is, I think that is changing. It's like every Chinese company came here also need to prepare themselves for the longer like a term. Don't have to fight for short term. First, you need to make sure you any product you came here, because the US market is the most competitive market in the world. Because it's mature, you have a lot of competition, very strong competition. Then you need to make sure you have core competence, you have competitive products, technology to compete with them. And then if you don't have, then you change the game. Just like an example, BYD is the, into the car industry in 2003. So then all the auto company, you can name it, is 100 years old. BYD is the youngest company. But then building the branding is not a one day's work. It's not Alibaba, all this kind of company, internet company, go to IPO, make a big name. Branding, <laughs> branding for the car, you need like a 50 years, 60 years storytelling. BYD, people trust, then you can build. And this is long term stuff. So, but then, if for the youngest people compare, compete with the like an older guy, how you do that? So our strategy is okay. BYD strength is what is a battery. Let's produce 
plug-in hybrid car. So back to 2000, uh, January of 2007, when uh, like in the Detroit Auto Show, all the like a, uh, GM and uh, all the big guys talking about our future dream, in 20 years they will have an EV plug-in, like an EV. Then BYD chairman, Mr. Wang, drove first plug-in hybrid car all the way in the exhibition to the booth. This blew the, the whole industry. <laughs> Everybody now, the next year, 50% uh, of the uh, car company bring their plug-in hybrid EV. Then the second year, everybody have introduced the EV. That's uh, like a, that's the uh, they that's the birth for the <laughs> what Nissan Leaf. So that's the kind of uh, stories. Like a, then we change the games. I think uh, now BYD is trying working very hard. They changing the game. Future. What's the definition for future car? It's no longer the engine. How big my engine? It's uh, how how quiet your car, mm. how less you pollute, and the, how intelligent your car. How much automation, automatic driving you can? That's a new definition. Mm -hmm. If we play this game, then BYD as a Chinese company, then we are in the leading position. Mm -hmm. That's the. Okay, thank experience. you. So let, let's uh, see if there are some more questions. Uh, uh, how about this uh, young lady right here? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Laura Schubert, and I'm a senior here at UCLA undergrad. Um, I'm also a Bruin, like a lot of people over here, so I'm very happy and thankful to have all of you here to share your experiences. Um, so I will be joining uh, Visa Inc. after graduation, the global payments technology company. So I have a very specific question directed for uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, I'm, I'm so anxious, but I don't job. know what to call you, but um, so as mentioned earlier that online cross-border shopping experience is emerging for um, both Chinese consumers and also American consumers. Um, I was wondering, so throughout the process, payment seems like to be a very important part. Um, at here at Visa, we try to make payments as seamless, as easy, as secure as possible. So do you have any comments on data security, upon uh, customer experiences, and how we can facilitate um, your business? Uh, that's a very good question, and that's the problem we are trying to solve. And I talked to Visa for uh, many months already, and uh, actually Visa is very interested in entering China. Mm -hmm. But there are regulations, there are you know, many, many uh, challenges. Um, right now, I'm providing American company to do business directly to China. So basically, imagine I'm taking the MB and paying them dollars. So it's not impossible, although the MB is not as uh, U.S. dollar yet, but it, it's coming. Even the government saying that you know they want to see the MB with a little bit more international currency flavor. Mm -hmm. So that's coming. So th those are the things that you have to solve. But uh, I can guarantee you, you it will be here pretty soon, sooner than you imagine. And pretty soon, Visa will find a way to enter China because right now China has its own you know uh, banking system that you need a union pay. Right, but then starting with this mobile smartphone revolution and starting with the acceptance of uh, third party payments. Many people in China, they use Zifu Bao, Yifu Bao, those kind of things just like the dollars already. So pretty soon, you are gonna see those kind of money flow and once you get connected to internet, there's no boundary can stop it. And pretty soon, you probably will prefer to use those kind of currency instead of US dollars, because you can probably buy many things in China and they will ship it to you. And all this background, you know, Visa, Master, they will handle international money currency transactions. So it, it will come, I don't have the solution, but you, I, would, I would guarantee you it will come pretty soon. Okay. Actually, I want to ask a question that's kind of uh, prompted by, by this question of our panelists, and that is um, there are probably a lot of uh, students in the audience who are interested in entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, do any of the panelists have any advice for, uh, for young uh, future entrepreneurs and innovators? I want to say something. Keep dreaming. Don't wake up. <laughs> <laughs> don't wake up. <laughs> don't, don't wake up. Don't drink up. <laughs> don't give up. <laughs> yeah. OK, I, uh, I can give you some uh, uh, my suggestion for you. And when you want to be an entrepreneur, 
uh, you want to start up your own business, right, first you have to choose the right business. Your target market big enough for you to grow. Because uh, I know some of the people, you know, uh, they already start up a company. They tell me, okay, we have uh, around the, the market size probably just 10,000, maybe 100,000 people. I think that that's the, not good enough, I think, for you to grow. Of course, you say, oh, I just want to do a small business. That's it. But I think that's not your dream. I think your dream should be bigger, right? <laughs> the second thing is they talk about the business. Uh, and um, I know that, you know, a lot of experts talk about that. Um, so we have your mail products, you know. Product, the product is good, but you're thinking about the, how to make a platform, okay? When you make a hardware, you think about how to do the service. Because I'm, as I know, the hardware industry is very hard to survive. And the margin is so low. You cannot imagine, like a, at a TV, at a TV set manufacturer, normally they just, could, just have a one or two percent gross profit. You have to pay, you know, salary, pay all those expenses. So the service is a, is a it's easier for you to depreciate from the other competitors. So that's uh, my, my opinion Great. about, the, about Great, this part. So I think maybe we have time for one, one or two more questions from the audience. Uh, I'm looking at my timekeeper here. So how about uh, this uh, woman here in the middle? So let's try to keep the questions brief because we're almost out of time. Hi, this is Joanna from China Enterprise Council. So um, thank you for the panelists and also the moderator to uh, put together such a great panel. And just now also, um, like Stella and other panelists also shared the views about challenges and the opportunities and for Chinese companies in, like Innovate in US. Um, since US, China, they're committed to um, you know, further uh, strengthening the, the, the economic ties between two countries. My question is um, to all the panelists, in your uh, relevant industry and sectors, have you seen the trend of U.S. and China uh, and Chinese businesses, actually, they are working together to innovate, which can, you know, help ease the um, challenges uh, in terms of like a market access for, for both sides. Thank you. Anyone care to uh, to comment on that? Let me make a general comment while our panelists are thinking. I was um, I spent many years in China, and, um, and more most recently in Shanghai, uh, and. While I was in Shanghai in particular, there were probably, this is now, I left there in 2007, there probably were at least 1,000 joint R&D centers between uh, big US companies and Chinese, uh, Chinese, Chinese entities. So I think it, it was clear to the US companies that there's a lot of talent in China. China is graduating hundreds of thousands of computer scientists and engineers and, uh, and very bright young people. Uh, and so they were setting up these R&D centers in China to develop products jointly for the Chinese market. And I think there's, there's tremendous potential for that. I, I'm curious if any of the, uh, of the panelists have any thoughts on that. Yes. I, I think like China, US are the two biggest markets. So then with the, all the internet <coughs> and the, all the like a cloud system, it's making innovation. It doesn't matter you're from US, you want to do business in China or in China, do business here. It's making it more easy. And uh, another big contribution, I think a lot of Chinese talent students came to U.S. for education. Then this brought a lot of uh, like a cooperation, mm -hmm. get more easy, and uh, in the future will be more broad. Yeah. Okay. Maybe one more question? Uh, let's see, I haven't done this side. Wait, way in the back there, in the corner. Uh, as, uh, as all those speakers just shared with us, um, it can be very tough for a startup or for some new brands getting to a new continent or a new market. But in my opinion, I think one of the most um, effect, uh, effective way approach to enter a new market is to leverage the um, entertainment content. So to be spe uh, specific, as uh, to um, um, to doing the pr product placement and uh, co-promotion with some big movies, there is a one um, figure to share with all of you. Um, the new released uh, uh, movie Fast and Furious Seven, the worldwide box office is five hundred uh, million. So uh, think about uh, you know uh, through this if you. Uh, integrate your brand or your product in this uh, movie and uh, how many audiences you can reach 
in you know just maybe um, two hours. So um, and uh, our uh, group is uh, leading um, marketing communication <laughs> group in China, okay. and we just got here. So uh, you know to help like uh, Suning BYD and also China Mobile. So you can you can exchange cards. <laughs> yeah, with them so we the, can uh, exchange cards later. But let me let me just say that um, I think that's a perfect note for us to uh, to conclude on because the next panel in this very room at 3:15 is media and entertainment, comma, uh, col cross border, con connecting the two markets through creativity and innovation. So I think that's exactly the sort of thing they'll be talking about the. Uh, the entertainment industry and ways for, uh, for cooperation <laughs> between the, uh, the U.S. and China. So with that, let me uh, thank all of you for your uh, patience, and let's uh, have a round of applause for the panelists.